as though there's only one kid in the story. Now normally, the oldest son is the only son, and then the second, third, and especially if you're the middle kid, you're non-existent. And, they, and so it's weird that the only son we talk about is the younger son, and as someone who is an older son, I wish we talked more about the older son. You need to recognize what's happening in the story on a couple of levels before we can get into anything like an application. When Jesus tells this story, he is speaking to two groups of people. And many people recognize the likelihood that one group represents the younger son and the other group represents the older son. So in this scenario, Jesus is standing or sitting and he's talking with people and one group is a group of sinners. The people that he's not supposed to hang out with. And the other group is the Pharisees. The religious elite, the, the smart ones, those who take care of the temple, the ones who are in charge, and they run the show and they don't know what to do with Jesus. And so there's these two groups of people, and Jesus says, hey, I'm going to tell you a story. And there's going to be two sons in the story. The story of a farmer, and he's got two sons. Like everybody in front of him will understand exactly what he's about to do, and he will actually make some of them very angry while he does it. The Pharisees have something to learn from the older brother in the story. The older brother is quite self-righteous, to be honest with you, and if you read the whole story, you'll see some of that. I like to think of them as the people that make going to church really, really hard. So in our culture, and it's always been true, there are people interested in faith, interested in spirituality, interested in God. If you're made in God's image, there's inevitably this desire. And yet churches, we have a great tradition of being very institutional and rigid and not open, and we run into trouble. One of my friends was at a church uh, in southern Ontario, and it had like 45 people or something on Sunday, and it had 200 people in an AA group that met every day. And so he started talking a little bit with the AA group, and over time, more and more of the AA group started to come to church. And then one day, the elders at a session meeting sat him down and said, Listen, pastor, this isn't working. All the wrong people are getting saved. Because Sunday was louder, and it was funnier, and they were having a good time. It's not who they were expecting. That's the Pharisee version of church, right? We're open, we're welcome, so long as you fit in these boxes that we already designed. It happens in broad ways, it happens in subtle ways. I had a person in a church, we were doing this thing called Look Who's Coming for Dinner. It was a way to get to know each other better. So the, the, it, was, it couldn't have been simpler. You signed up as a host and you said, I can host this many people. Or you signed up as a guest and you said, I have this many people, here's our you know, dietary restrictions, whatever. And then a volunteer says, on Friday, I don't know, October 10th, open your door at 5 and see who's there. And so you open your door and you have no idea who, you just knew that six people were coming, right? And then you had a meal. It couldn't be simpler. The amount of flack the person who organized it got made her never volunteer to do anything ever, ever again because she hadn't done look who's coming to dinner properly as if this had super clear rules that she was supposed to know beforehand. Jesus is talking to both groups of people, the sinners and those who think they know how church and temple and God work in the world. And so you want to hold that. And you want to notice at the end of the story, if you feel like you might be in that group, that that son receives grace in the end. He is invited to the table with the father despite whatever he brings to the story. Now the Pharisees in the story, they're checking out Jesus in the long term of, of Luke. They're really frustrated by him because all of the riffraff, the marginalized, are drawn to Jesus. He's getting these big crowds. And you know who doesn't go to the temple? Big crowds, right? And so they're jealous. They're mad because Jesus is getting traction where they can't. And they also talk about it like he would never associate with these people if he was really, truly a godly person. Today, we might talk about being open to the abused and the abuser, to the addict, to the porn watcher. Take your pick. You're welcome to go to church still. When a newspaper at one point asked G.K. Chesterton what was wrong with the world, they thought he was in the Pharisee camp. 
They thought he would explain with great moral gravitas and authority all that was wrong with culture, and he would write them a long article. He wrote, Dear Sirs, I am sincerely yours, G.K. Chesterton. They had a lot of extra space for ads, I guess. It's important to remember all this part because most of the time when people preach on this story, all they talk about is the younger brother. They ignore the role of the Pharisee and they ignore the role of grace going in every direction. And I don't want to do that, but I also do want to do that because in my prayer time this week, I really felt like we're supposed to talk about this younger brother and there's a challenge for you by the end of the sermon. So... If you're worried you're maybe more in line with the Pharisees and the established church, you should reread the whole thing in Luke and just take some time and look at it because there's lots there to read. But I think we're supposed to focus on the younger brother for a specific reason today. The younger brother dishonors the father in the story. At the time, Pharisee and sinner alike, both groups, everybody would have understood this. And the story is bizarrely short. The kid asks for his inheritance, which if you're paying attention, he's the younger son, he doesn't really have any right to the inheritance at all, okay? So he's already stepping out a little bit. And then it says, his father sold whatever and uh, gave it to him. It's like six words. In the culture at the time, if somebody did this, the appropriate response of the father would literally be to beat the child and conceivably send them off into the wilderness by themselves and say, you are officially disinherited. You have so badly shamed our family's name that you are to be removed from any association with us. That, everybody in the group would have been like, yep, exactly. The Pharisees would have thought that was great. And the sinners would have been like, yeah, yeah, that's what happened to me. That's, you know, that's why I'm, and, and they all would have gone home. And so when the father doesn't do that, you're getting a hint at the grace and the abundance in the story right in the second part, second line of the story. So the young brother, he wants to do what feels good. He wants to take the easiest path forward. So he asks for this inheritance. The father does this. And then he goes off and does all this stuff. I read a rabbi that argues that when a Jew is feeding pigs, which is the aha moment for the kid, this would be most akin to either being a drug dealer or a pimp. Like it would be like you wake up and you thought you were doing something fine. You're like, wait a second. How did I wind up outside of this junior high selling dope? Maybe I should go back home and talk to my dad. Right, like that wake up moment, that's where he is. So he says, I'm gonna go back. But imagine for a moment what he's going back to. And then understand the father. The father has given up something dear that nobody thinks he should. He should have kicked the kid out, but he sold land. And you know what that would mean? It means all the people that worked that land, whose livelihoods depended on him owning that land, are now out to lunch with no food. They are furious. And so a lot of people who read this think that what happens in the story is really, really critical. When the kid is coming back and the dad is watching for him, he's watching because the people might mob the kid. They are so angry at what they have lost because of what he did. The dad is probably always, always watching in case his kid dares to show up back in the village and show his face because it would be very dangerous for him to do it. The father has lost all public credibility at this point. Jesus clearly wants us to understand that's how God looks at us, right? No matter what we've done, no matter how outrageous it is, no matter how much people around us might be mad at us and want to mob us and be rid of us, God is out there sacrificially reaching to us. He gives us more abundantly than we can expect, like the father who sells this land. He forgives us whatever foolishness we do, and he's willing to look foolish in the way he does it. Any reasonable person would question this. It's subtle here. 
The older brother is who actually pays the price, right? You notice that? So if you, if you sell half the land, now you have one piece of land left, but you still have two kids. So if you're going to let that other kid come back, it's at the cost of the inheritance of the second one, right? It's his half. His half gets diminished in the story. He gets pretty upset. This is aligned with what we did in September. Jesus is like the new, better, older brother. Willingly giving up his portion. Willingly, graciously giving you the inheritance that is due to him and him alone. We don't have the natural right to it any more than that younger son did. And Jesus does it. And that is infuriating if you're the older brother type. If you think you deserve love or grace and you're confronted with the reality that it's free and unearned, this is very difficult. Ken Shigematsu, he's a great pastor. He has a short story about this. Uh, uh, there's a journalist friend of his told him this story about a guy named Arjun in India. As a young man, Arjun moves from Mumbai to work, or to Mumbai to work as a chef. He gets mixed up with the wrong crowd and ends up working as a pimp. He would go to the lobbies of five-star hotels and invite men to have sexual encounters with women and children. Though he was making a lot of money, he feel restless and unfulfilled. One day, for no apparent reason, he walked into a church sanctuary and began praying. This experience inspired a spiritual quest, and he eventually met Jesus. Thanks to the presence of Jesus in his life, Arjun no longer works as a pimp, but is now using culinary skills to train women who want to leave the sex trade to become professional cooks so that they can begin a new way of life. Because of Jesus' presence in his life, Arjun is now serving women and children instead of exploiting them. Partly you love it because it's a story of redemption and reclamation and restoration, but partly don't you think like he was a pimp of little women and children? Radical love and forgiveness somehow enters the world where you and I on our best day, probably don't have that in us. I know, well, I hope, none of us have done anything as degrading to others as Arjun has. But if you take a moment to think about what you have done in life that might bring you shame, some part of life that you don't feel like you're enough, some part of life that you wouldn't even want your spouse to know, let me give you a second. Think of this part of life where you you went off the rails and you know it. Imagine Jesus is the father in the parable. He runs towards you in that moment. He embraces you as you recognize what's happened. Imagine him covering you with a robe, placing a ring on your finger, Declaring he wants to hold a feast in your honor. He speaks words of love and affection and blessing over you. So Christians are called to live in the confidence of Jesus Christ, not in ourselves. We are called to be clothed in him. At the core of shame is the fear of being unlovable, the fear of being rejected. What the younger brother deserves in the story, what we deserve in our stories. But in God's loving presence, you are seen and you are known and you are accepted and you are loved. And there's this father running out to you. It's hard to accept, depending what you've done in life. Nobody, I think, could be more understanding at the end of the story than that younger son. He's had unearned grace. He's had this party thrown for him. So 
So whenever somebody does something wildly inappropriate in that village, I like to think that son is the one who would be like, it's okay, man, we'll figure this out. We can work on this. We'll get there. Because he himself has had God put his arm around him. And it's a call for Christians everywhere to do that. To somehow recognize where God has put his arm around us and where we then have to put our arm around somebody else who needs it badly and who everybody around would not want to put an arm around them. The kingdom of God where lepers are cleansed, where the marginal people find homes. Helping others is making them feel safe. And it has a powerful impact on their lives. It helps them overcome shame and reclaim life itself. And we can only find resources to do that when we remember our own story. So I've been planning Advent. I know it's a long way away. And this is why we're focusing on the younger side. I've been doing all this Advent stuff. And it feels to me, and I'm very confident in this, I'm rarely this confident in the Holy Spirit stuff, so it's weird for me. I'm very Presbyterian this way. But I'm very confident that we here need to watch for some kind of prodigal person. I don't know if we're supposed to watch it as a group together, or if you're supposed to watch in your life, and I'm pretty sure not everybody's going to find a prodigal over the holidays. But if you're here, or if you're online, it, it's not random. You didn't walk into Tim Hortons and the sermon broke out. Like, that's not how this worked. So you were supposed to be here, and I think I'm supposed to tell you to watch. I don't know who you're watching for. I'm pretty confident one or more of us will have the opportunity to put our arm around a prodigal. Whether we notice them, whether we do it, that's really up to us. I'm going to end with this, though. The more fully we grasp our own forgiveness the ways in which we're either the prodigal, the Pharisee, or some combination of both. The more radically we understand that God loves us and welcomes us and offers us grace and invitation to his table, the more likely we can help somebody else grow. And then we help grow Jesus' kingdom as we do it. So please watch. I have no idea where this goes. If it does go somewhere, I would love to hear it because it's weird for me to think that we have this level of clarity on something. So let me know. For now, we'll pray that we can be open. Let's join our hearts and minds in prayer. Father, we pray. <laughs> we don't know who we're waiting for. But Father, we pray that we would be open, that our eyes and our hearts and our ears would be open. that we would notice, that we would remember where you have forgiven us, where you have comforted us and loved us, and that we would be able to offer comfort and love to whoever it is you bring. Lord, we pray that we would have the willingness to follow you in this. We pray for signs of you at work in our hearts, in our community, in our lives. Lord, we're your people. And we look forward with hope and with joy of what you will do in us and through us. Amen.